Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sakeli, I'm a commercial diver, and we are continuing our investigation into the Ocean Gate Titan submersible. The United States Coast Guard just uploaded 27 new documents to the Marine Board of Investigation document library. Now we're not going to go through everything. A lot of this information is just going to be like brochure, marketing data, and emails. The topics that I want to cover today are the titanium end gluing procedures and the Titan operations manual. This is the official manual from OceanGate themselves, which was subpoenaed during this investigation. There's some very critical information in there, so stick around. Allegedly, there's also a federal investigation underway digging into the financials and the business structure of OceanGate Incorporated. Now, I'm not an engineer, but I am a maritime professional and I have spent thousands of hours on and in the water. My goal is just to go through the information and present it in a digestible format for everyone. Now, if you guys have any additional input or if I got anything wrong, feel free to leave it in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I personally have a couple questions for you guys. Without further ado, let's dive into part five of our Ocean Gate Titan investigation. This is take two because I recorded three hours of footage the other day and two and a half hours had bad audio. Now, this is the official titanium end segment gluing procedure document straight from OceanGate. This is procedure um, overview that was subpoenaed from the U.S. Coast Guard. So we are going to get to the type of glue that they used and why that was a major issue. But we are also just going to go through the entire procedure together so we can familiarize ourselves with the entire process. Now, this is just like the day before and the day um, of they're just saying to measure the rings and just make sure that everything's within tolerance. Go ahead and just load everything up and deliver it to Electro Impact. They're just getting crane training from the guys at Electro Impact. Now remember, Electro Impact is the place up in Muckleteo, Washington, where they um, where they spooled the carbon fiber hole. So they spooled the hole, and then they would drive over to the autoclave, cure the glue, drive it back to Electro Impact, wind the next layer on until they had five inches now um so now they're back here after the everything's complete and they're getting ready to install the hole they're just saying unload the titanium end segments the old carbon fiber hole domes and equipment at electro impact during training days so the old carbon fiber hole is going to be there with them so maybe they're just looking for any major discrepancies before between the old hole and the new hole. So this is clearly after the original hole was struck by lightning and they had to decommission it. They were pretty much forced to stop even though Stockton wanted to go full speed ahead. Now they're saying that they're gonna put the aft titanium end, end segment down on the cardboard so that it's resting on its seal face. And then they're gonna cover the bond surface of the segments to protect from any foreign contaminants with aluminum foil. So essentially what they're doing is going to place the aft ring face down, just like this, on its uh, seal face. And then um, this is obviously, this is after the, um, the ring was recovered, but the flange is going to be face up. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna take the hole and then drop the hole onto the flange um, after they put glue on, of course. But let's go back to the other document. Okay, so next they're going to prep the carbon fiber hole. So they're going to uh, just take some masking tape, label one end of it forward, one end of it aft with uh, blue masking tape. Then they're going to degrease the bonding surfaces. So at the top and bottom of the hole, they're going to just wipe that down. Now, it doesn't say what they're going to degrease it with, but later on down here, it says um, to wipe the surfaces of the carbon fiber hole using MEK or toluene. And that's misspelled, but those are common. Um, uh, I forget the I forget the word, but those are common chemicals that that we use in the diving industry when we need to patch um, if we need to put glue on a patch and we really need to clean it up and get all that all the um, contaminants out of there so the glue can really adhere to whatever surface we're putting it on. Um, a lot of times we're, you know, patching our dry suits or patching a lift bag or something like that. So uh, we are familiar with those uh, chemicals. Going back to step four, it says lightly roughen the bond surfaces of the carbon fiber hole using an abrasive. Well, it's funny that they just say just using an abrasive because what are we talking about here? Are we talking about sandpaper? Are we talking about Scotch-Brite pad? 
you know, they're not very specific. You know, what what uh, grit sandpaper are we using? And then it just says, just do not expose reinforced fibers, which obviously that would be the last thing that they would want. But um, yeah, a, a little bit more of a description there would be helpful. Now, step six, it says they're going to confirm that the compressed air for blowing particulates is clean and dry before step six, and then blow particulates off the carbon fiber hole using clean, dry, compressed air. Now, I'm not sure what their filtration systems are like for their compressors over at Electro Impact, but typically there's going to be a little bit of moisture and a little bit of oil residue in a lot of these big shop compressors. Um, a lot of them are like belt driven. So they, so the pumps have a little bit of oil in them. So you will get some contaminants in there. We also have those contaminants in our diving compressors. So we have typically, we have multiple stages for filtration to get all the moisture out, get all the residue out. I would imagine Electro Impact has something like that, but um, we can't really confirm. Okay, so now they're prepping the titanium uh, ring for the aft. This is the one that's gonna be on the floor, on the shop floor. And it just says to degrease the bond surfaces um, of the titanium aft segment, and then record the contact angle throughout the wiping process. So they're gonna check for contaminants, lightly roughen the bond surface, and then degrease the bond surface of the aft titanium segment one last time. And then, this is important because remember, they're reusing the titanium rings. So likely what they had to do was after they got the carbon fiber hole separated, they then had to go through and uh, machine down all that glue. That may have taken some material off, So, but it's also, it's also likely that the surface is smooth and they have to roughen those up. How they're gonna confirm that it's rough enough is they're using a surface analyst reader. So I believe it's gonna be like one of these guys here. It's got this handheld machine with a probe on it. And then I think you can set the desired roughness uh, for lack of a better term and make sure that you've got um, a good enough area so that the glue will have adhesion. Because if you're just putting glue on a smooth mirror surface, it's, it's not gonna stick, right? So you need to have that roughened up quite a bit. So they're doing that both to the titanium segment and the carbon fiber hole. So now they're finally getting ready to attach the hole to the aft segment. And this step one is my favorite. So it says review the high saw document. The high saw uh, is the the high saw document is the document for the glue. Um, we're going to go over that here shortly. But it says so go over the glue document to familiarize yourself with use and application of the adhesive. Well, shouldn't that have already been performed? They shouldn't be familiarizing themselves as they're putting everything together here. But in any case, um, it says gather adhesive materials and shims. So, you know, like their, their putty knives and all that their putty knives and everything that they're gonna use to apply the glue and shims. So they have a total of 10 shims. I wish I could flip this photo upside down for you guys, but they have a total of 10 shims. And what they do is uh, place them evenly um, between the hole and the titanium aft segment. And then that'll, they're pretty much using the shims to center the, uh, center the uh, titanium ring to uh, to the hole so you don't want it um obviously if they're able to drop this on here there's going to be a little bit of a gap especially after machining down the flanges you don't want it leaning too far to one side or the other because that's going to throw everything off and then it says lower hole onto dunnage protect the carbon fiber hole from coming in contact with the dunnage by covering the contact points in aluminum foil this is the second time they've uh, mentioned aluminum foil so pretty much they're they've got the hole prepped and they are placing it on uh, wood blocks essentially next to the ring that they're going to the aft ring that they're going to place it on and then they'll lift it up over but between the dunnage and the hole they have little pieces of aluminum foil i guess to just protect the hole from getting some sort of wood splinters or contaminants on the hole but I thought that that was interesting that that's what they're using. And then they're going to go around with a um, with blue tape and just mark off on the hole so they don't have excess glue squeezing out onto the hole or onto the ring. 
And then this is my second favorite part here. Use a stiff brush or small towel to coat bonding surfaces on carbon fiber hull and aft segment. Yeah, because those are very similar, those have very similar properties, a uh, stiff brush or, or a small towel. You know, it's funny how they mix that up or they just throw both those in there casually, uh, both of those options. Whatever you're feeling today, stiff brush or a small towel to coat the bonding surfaces on this, on this submersible that's going down to the Titanic, whatever you guys are feeling. And then those shims I told you guys about, it says that they're going to coat those shims in adhesive. Those are going to be removable shims, so that's why they want those coated, because they don't want glue adhering to those. So they're just going to coat them in it in adhesive, and then they install them on the aft segment. So they pre-install those uh, shims. So, like I said, I wish this photo, I could spin this photo upside down for you guys, but this is pretty much the, what, what they're doing. But there's going to be a ring down there at the bottom that they're the aft ring that they're dropping it onto and they would have the straps rigged up to the um rigged up to the hole essentially they're not going to be rigged up like this like how they have it shown in this photo they're probably just testing to make sure that the rings are going to fit so now they would have the um the aft ring installed they remove the shims then they'll do the same thing to the forward ring which is the ring that's going to be dropped on top and then the only difference is here is they're, they're going to use a plumb bob and a level to make sure that the forward ring on top is in line with the bottom ring. And then the next thing that they're going to do that's different is they're going to place a clump weight on top, which I'm assuming that's going to be like an I-beam or something like that, because it says lay out and secure the clump weight to the forward segment so it's safe for people to climb in and out of the vertical hole without risk of the clump weight dropping on them. So it's not going to be something that's going to prevent folks from climbing inside and and working on the inside of the hole and so the reason why they need to get inside there is so that they can install their rtm system and their their real-time monitoring system so they need to install all the sensors now as well as the uh, acoustic um, sensors and they need to place all those in there um, now so here it says allow high sol EA9394 adhesive, which is also known as Loctite EA9394. It's the glue holding the family together. To cure for three to five days. Now that's something that I have a major problem with because why are they so lax on the cure time? They shouldn't say, oh, either three days or five days, even though that might be what the manufacturer recommends you should just round up to the five days. I mean, this is something that you don't want to cut any corners on. Um, and so there should be no room for any sort of confusion or mishap here. You know, if you guys have ever used like JB Weld or something like that, uh, two part epoxy adhesive. Well, you know, there's a major difference between letting, letting it cure for a couple hours and letting it cure for a few days. A few days it's going to be rock hard but you know after a couple hours it's it's not even hard yet now let's go take a look at loctite ea 9394 so here we have loctite ea 9394 arrow it's an epoxy paste adhesive also known as high ea 9394 now here once again we have something from the aerospace industry that they're trying to introduce into the submersible industry um, two completely different environments and so it says here the arrow is a two-part structural paste adhesive which cures at room temperature and possesses excellent strength to 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 177 degrees Celsius and higher okay so let's look at that again 350 degrees Fahrenheit what is the temperature down there at the Titanic it's gonna be freezing or even below freezing so they're over 300 they're using an adhesive that it is that is designed to hold excellent strength 300 degrees warmer than the depth in the actual operating temperature uh, where this glue is going to be used but let's continue on so it says it's thixotropic nature and excellent high temperature compressive strength also make it ideal for potting filling and liquid shim applications long tight ea9394 arrow is these other classifications i didn't look into those if anyone wants to look into those feel free uh, to let us know in the comments okay so its features are room temperature cure good gap filling 
high temperature performance, potting material, room temperature storage, outstanding mechanical properties, long pot life, and low toxicity. Now, here are the uncured properties. So it's a two-part, uh, so it's a two-part epoxy. And if anyone's interested in the viscosity, there it is. It has a shelf life of one year. Now it says here during the for the uh, application, it says do not mix quantities greater than 450 grams. And if we look back at that footage, um, now if we look back at that footage where they were mixing this, 450 grams is about two cups uh, or a little less. They're pretty close to that. So I don't know. They must have been very right on the borderline, I think, because I think they were pretty close to having two cups mixed there. Now it says the bonding surfaces should be clean, dry, properly prepared, for optimum surf surface prep, consult a Loctite surface prep guide. So again, there's another rabbit hole we can go down if we want to look at another document there. But um, so it says that handling strength for this adhesive will occur in 24 hours at room temperature, after which the support tooling or pressure used during cure may be removed so the clump weight if they wanted to they can take that off but i feel like they would just leave that on for a few days now the cure time for this it says that it's three to five days at room temperature so like we said earlier the three to five days is fine if it's in the if it's in the um if it's in the data sheet and if it's in the documents from the manufacturer but that's not okay when you're when you have steps that you need to follow uh from the um from the company itself it should just be set in stone how long we're gonna let it cure if we're gonna let it cure and if we're unsure well let's just go to five days just to be safe but but anyways that's a kind of a different topic for a different day it says that they can accelerate the cures um, with higher temperatures so bump it up to 200 degrees fahrenheit or or 150 degrees and it'll speed up the cure time now this is something that intrigued me uh tensile lap shear strength so if anyone wants to give a better explanation on this or correct me if i'm wrong that would be fantastic so according to this it's it seems like lap shear strength is when you have the titanium ring and then you have the carbon fiber hole and a lap shear strength would be the the f amount of force that it takes to separate those two um, in a sideways motion, a shearing motion. So not a tensile strength. A tensile would be um, would be pulling apart. It would be a shear strength. So like forcing two different materials against each other. Whatever amount of force it takes for that glue or adhesive to give, I believe that is a lap shear strength. So tensile lap shear strength, also known as lap shear strength, is a measure of how well an adhesive can resi resist forces applied in the plane of the bonded surfaces. Tensile lap shear strength is determined by measuring the failure stress of an adhesive, which is calculated by dividing the failing load by the bond area. Lap shear strength is a good indicator of adhesive structural strength and the long-term durability of a bonded joint. Okay, so now going back to our document here, they have different test temperatures for their lap shear strength uh, testing results. And it seems to be strongest around room temperature, 77 degrees, which is going to be 4,200 PSI. 4,200 PSI is the amount of pressure that it takes to separate or to shear those two materials apart. But they don't have anything that's around the same temperature as the, um, the water temperature of the Titan, which is going to be around freezing. Let's just roll. Let's just let's just go with this for the sake of argument. Let's just go with the highest PSI, which is going to be 4,200 PSI. Now let's take a look at what the pressure is. Okay, so let's do a little math here. So the Titan is rated to go to 4,000 meters, which is 13,100 feet. So let's plug that in. Here we're going to convert the uh, feet of seawater, and that's gonna give us our PSI at that depth. So let's plug this in. It's gonna be 13,100 feet, and that's gonna give us 5,822 PSI. So 5,800 PSI. So that is 1,600 PSI higher 
than their highest shear strength rating. Now, yes, there is going to be external forces forcing, uh, forcing the rings and the domes inward. There's going to be an inward force on both ends. So why do I bring that up? Um, it's because the the carbon fiber hole is going to compress at a different rate than the titanium. We know that. So that in itself could have caused shearing. So as that hole compresses and the titanium ring is staying, is staying, is keeping most of its shape and the carbon fiber is compressing, um, that technically could be a shearing force, right? Like the, like we know from the NTSB report that the flange flanges did in fact shear inward. They did shear inward, um, and we can tell that here by all these by all these grooves. That's going to happen from a shearing force. And look, just just pay. I mean, just look at the amount of glue that's remaining. There's none on there. Um, so, but but we can tell that the glue. But we can tell that the titanium ring rings were roughened up. You can kind of see the roughened surface there. But but anyways. Yeah, the, the flanges were sheared. And here are more looks at the inner rings. Now, technically, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but this would be a shearing force. Oh, man, I think that's steel. I think that's rust. Now, now that would be a shearing force. Well, we, we know that there's going to be pressure inward from both sides, from both ends pushing inward. So it's, so it's not as simple as well it was rated for uh, 1600 psi less well i'm sure there's going to be other calculations that would that would sort of not allow the full 5800 psi to be to have a shearing force like everything is still going to compress the titanium and the carbon fiber is both going to compress just at different rates so i would say that that is that definitely contributes to the cyclic fatigue as everyone calls it all the all the compressing, compressing of the hole and decompressing and all those cycles that it had to go through. Now, I got to give credit where it's due. A uh, huge shout out to forensic engineering and failure analysis. So this guy actually did some groundwork um, uh, and reached out to directly to Loctite or the manufacturer here. And he said that they used the wrong epoxy because this epoxy actually has an aluminum filler in it. So here's this video if you guys want to go check it out. Um, he actually had a phone call with one of the reps there at Loctite and he posted the phone call in there. And what she explains is that there's an aluminum filler in the in the adhesive. Well, why is that an issue? Well, you have the titanium ring and then you have an aluminum filler. And if you submerge both of those, you have a difference, two different metals in contact with each other and you submerge them in salt water, which is going to cause galvanic corrosion. So anytime you have two different metals in water submerged, the weaker metal is going to corrode and sacrifice itself to protect the more noble metal. So let's take a look at a chart of nobility. As Hemingway said, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. So this is a chart of the most noble to least noble metals. Essentially, no most noble means that these are highly resistant to corrosion. So at the top, we have a stainless steel and titanium. So those are the top two, very highly resistant to corrosion. So zinc and aluminum, those sacrifice so quickly underwater that zinc and aluminum is, is what is installed on steel structures underwater to prevent the steel structures from corroding so this is an old video i have on my youtube channel if you guys want to check it out underwater welding welding anodes so here you can see that there's a steel piling for a dock and see all these rust spots on the dock well that's a problem so this this steel structure in itself is corroding because it's submerged underwater so what we're going to do is weld these aluminum anodes onto this pile so that the aluminum anodes will corrode instead of the pile. These are called sacrificial anodes. Sacrificial because they will sacrifice themselves in order to protect the more noble metal. So this is a form of galvanic corrosion in a good sense. So 
any two metals that are submerged underwater, the least noble is going to corrode to protect the most noble. So looking back at our chart here, zinc and aluminum, those are the materials that we use for sacrificial anodes. And then we have steel right behind it. So, so you can imagine with titanium, I'm going to show you guys one more example. Okay, so what we have here, these are actually titanium brackets. And these are installed on plain old steel I-beams. Now, if I zoom out, you can see this shiny section right here. This is what uh, steel looks like underwater when you clean off all the rust and everything. It's just shiny, bright metal. Now, what we have going on here, there's a few different things, but this is a this is galvanic corrosion in a nutshell. We have a titanium bracket and we have a stainless bolt. Notice how the titanium bracket and stainless bolt are doing just fine. Well, these washers were galvanized. Now, galvanized steel just has a galvanized coating on it. Once that coating corrodes, then they're pretty much just plain old steel. Um, they will rust just like normal steel. When this when this plate was installed, whoever installed it inst uh, left it so that the, the last bolt over here was hanging on the edge of this I-beam. So this I-beam has uh, slowly corroded over, over time, has corroded away. And I'll give you a good look at a, uh, a bad washer and a good washer here. So just pay attention to this dock washer. See how eaten away this washer is? It's also paper thin. You guys can't really tell because I'm moving pretty quick here. But it's also got a uh, pretty large opening where the bolt hole is. And that's because this metal is corroding to protect the aluminum, um, to protect the titanium and stainless steel. And then this is what a good washer looks like. So major difference. But we're just doing a temporary fix here and just swapping this out. Now take a look at the titanium. So even though stainless and titanium are high on the chart for noble metals, well, it's still causing some corrosion, some galvanic corrosion to the bracket here because there's such a difference in metals all here in one location. And then... So you can see here when we chip away the rust, it's just shiny bare metal that's exposed. And then um, you have to look closely here, but this edge of this I-beam is actually corroded back. So this steel is less noble than the titanium, so it's corroding even further. Here you can get a good look at that backside, how that I-beam is eaten away. So maybe the glue that they should have used was Loctite EA 9395. And so it's pretty much the same thing here, but it has that non-metallic filler. So instead of having an aluminum filler, what it, what it uses is a silica filler. So both of these fillers are going to be, um, both of these fillers are going to be like a powder that's, that's mixed into one of the parts of the epoxy and it just gets mixed in. You don't even know it's there. And obviously, OceanGate didn't even know it's there, or they didn't care. This epoxy wasn't designed for submersibles. The service temperature on this is 350 degrees. It's designed to be used in the aerospace industry. Now, this is another uh, noble chart. This one is from Dark Arrow. They make some pretty cool-looking airplane kits, so like kits that you can buy yourself and then build them. Now, they also have an issue with galvanic corrosion because there's such a difference in temperature. And then they are also using aluminum, titanium, and carbon fiber. So why is that important? So this is essentially a noble chart, right? The aluminum is going to be the least noble, so it's going to corrode the quickest. Stainless steel and titanium are going to be next. And then carbon fiber is going to be the most noble out of all these uh, materials. Now, I didn't know this, but carbon fiber is actually conductive. So not only do you have the titanium and aluminum touching, but you also have to account for the, the aluminum filler in contact with the carbon fiber. So aluminum is going to be protecting both titanium and carbon fiber. And you just saw an underwater example of what happens when 
titanium, stainless steel, and bare steel are all in contact with each other. They all start to kind of eat away. So, so that's a big reason why they should have went with the 9395, which is going to be the exact same, but it has a silica filler, not a conductive aluminum filler. So the Coast Guard also released the operations manual for the submersible Titan. This is something that we've been waiting for for quite a while. And I have this little handy dandy visual aid here in the corner. So hopefully this helps as uh, we're kind of going through the manual and looking at some things here. A lot of this information we already know, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. But all the but there are a lot of small details that I want to go over with you guys and things that, that I learned reading this manual. Now, this manual, the last time it was revised was in 2019 when the original hole was still being, uh, when the original hole was still being used before the lightning struck and then they rebuilt the second hole in 2021. Um, this is going to have a lot of your pre and post dive checks and everything there and as well as some emergency checklists and additional features including your your oxygen systems your alarms your communications and we know about the lars and surfacing procedures so in the intro this doc it just says this documents issued to all pilots and titan operations personnel and shall be made available um, to any outside contractors or inspecting bodies involved in the day-to-day -day running of the operation so like coast guard osha uh, anyone like that and the contents of this manual should provide an adequate level of information of titan operational procedures for all parties concerned it will be assumed that the qualified pilots through the surface personnel have had adequate training in their field their individual the individual training of personnel will be covered in the pilot and surface ops training manuals Oh, I wish we had those manuals, the pilot and surface operations training manuals. I wish they would release those, and maybe some day they will, but I'm very eager to find out what their training requirements were for their pilots, because according to Lockridge, they were trying to develop some sort of uh, training manual where they can have pilots trained in a day, which is kind of crazy. You're, you're bypassing decades of education, and then the surface ops trainings that is probably for the for the mission specialists but as well as the uh the employees and the crew on board the uh the motherships this is the titan command module checklist now remember we were just talking about anodes well, the thrusters do have anodes which is typical for most vessels um so i'm sure for like rovs and things like that they have their own uh thrusters to protect the gears and uh, propellers and like in the shaft um, now, I didn't see any anodes for the frame. It's possible that they didn't, that they don't include this in the operations manual. So these, these are just all the checks that they have to go through. And then the internal checks, um, you're checking all the electrical, making sure that everything is on and works, making sure you have, that your reserve cylinders, making sure that the reserve cylinders work. Now, there's actually four reserve cylinders, and those sit below the deck inside the titan and then you have one main day o2 cylinder which is stationed uh in the corner um i'll see if i could try to find a photo for you guys now they have um an atmospheric monitor that's just testing the um the internal air inside the cabin for co2 and oxygen and they also have lithium blankets now i had to research these and we'll get to those later but that was my first time really like looking into the lithium blankets and what those were. So through hole penetrator wiring, they need to inspect that. Um, and we'll go, we'll go through these things here, but uh, just checking your life support, O2 masks, things like that. And then your final pre-dive check, I believe. So, so your, your final pre-dive check before you launch. Okay, now I find this kind of odd. It, it goes straight from pre-dive check to post-dive check. There's no in water checks which um for us in the in the diving industry we do our pre-dive checks and then as soon as we hop in the water we ensure that everything is working properly part of that is because everything can seem like it's working properly 
uh, before you hop in. And then once you hop in there, you can have an issue. Like there was one time in dive school where I dove a helmet that had been cleaned and inspected. It had been checked and signed off by someone else. Uh, I had the supervisor do a pre-dive check and inspect my helmet to ensure everything was working, including the purge button. I climbed down the ladder. Thank God I didn't hop in and go straight to the bottom without fins. Cause like a lot of divers like to do because I, because when I climbed down that ladder, the water in my helmet started to fill up and what well, all it was, was just a small little diaphragm that was just folded over in the corner and my helmet started to fill up with water and I wasn't able to purge it out. So that, that was a called a Gorski helmet, RIP Gorski. That guy uh, passed away a couple years ago, but anyways, they don't have any in water checks, which was kind of uh, eye opening to me, but it just skips straight to a post dive checks where they just check all their gas systems. They log their O2 pressure um, and then check all their uh, systems. And then they log all the battery levels and then shut everything down. For the most part, the emergency procedures are what you would expect. Um, it, so in, with emergency procedures, you're going to most likely have the most common uh, failures towards the top. So like the most common one, the first one that they have listed is power failure of internal batteries, in which case you would shut off all the breakers and then and then turn everything back on uh, in this order. And then again, they have power failure of external batteries will shut down everything and then reboot the system. We know that they had a power failure before, so maybe this is more of a common issue than what they would care to admit. Now, deballasting and jetting, drop weight tray release procedure. So there's a couple ways that they can release the weights here, uh, and we'll get into that. And then this is a CO2 scrubber failure. So that little, their O2 scrubber system, this little computer fan, this is a 24 volt computer fan, which is blowing the air that they're respirating into this box. This is gonna, this is gonna have soda sorb inside of it and it's gonna absorb all the CO2. And then coming out of this box is going to be air without the CO2. And then they're supplementing with fresh oxygen here. Now, speaking of the oxygen, you can see here, we got one oxygen tank, two oxygen tanks, and then there's also a spot here for three and four oxygen tanks. So there wasn't just the, the two there, there's actually four. And then forward up here, it's very rare and you, you don't really see any photos of it, but there's an, there's an oxygen tank that I've seen here a couple times that that one is going to have the flow meter on it. And that's going to be what they're calling their day tank or their main tank. Oh, here's actually, this is actually the flow meter right here. So this is the pressure gauge that's coming in from the, from the O2 tank. And then right here, this is the flow meter that they're using to adjust the, the amount of O2 that's bleeding freely into the air. And then as they absorb that oxygen and respirate CO2, the CO2 is going to get absorbed by this fan. It's going to get absorbed into this box where they have soda sorb. It's a, uh, it's a powder that's going to absorb the CO2 and then uh, on and then it's going to release air back into the atmosphere here without uh, without CO2 in it. And then they have procedures for their HP air release. I'll show you guys where that tank is and what that's for. Um, they have lots of communications. It says the submersible sends status data continuously to the surface. If connection with surface is lost for more than 60 minutes, sub will surface. Well, we know that that didn't happen and it took them hours to notify the Coast Guard. I think it was, what? how long was it? Was it eight hours that it took them to uh, notify the Coast Guard? You know, after 60 minutes, that should have been a major red flag and they should have been more urgently looking for help. But as we're looking through the, the order of the uh, emergency procedures, well, it's almost like they anticipated having some sort of, uh, having some sort of power failure or communications breakdown. And then this is probably one of the worst ones is smoke or fire in internally. And then they have entanglement. So they'll notify the mothership and tell them what their depth is. 
and then if they can't get out they'll they have an rov that they'll send down but um but but there was a gentleman during one of the hearings um he had a black shirt gray hair i can't remember his name but he was he is he was a contractor he helped he was there on that last expedition when the tragedy happened and um he's he said that they had rovs but they couldn't handle going to the depth that was needed to recover the titan or to at least go even go search for it which is a scary thought that like your backup system can't reach you so you know so that's like you're stuck so it's like a diver being stuck at 100 feet and then the standby diver hopping in to go rescue him and and he only has a 50 foot hose so he can't go any deeper he can't save you that would just be scary man okay and then um and then they actually have a emergency call for if there's any flooding and that would be x-ray 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 and then they'll they would say that they're flooding their depth is whatever feet and they're doing an emergency surface and then they would blow their vbt and i'll show you what that is here shortly so here they're just going over their exostructure just familiar familiarizing everyone with the frame and the acrylic viewport and then it, it also says that the hole is fitted with four penetration plates that accommodate electrical, air, and hydraulic systems. So if we look at these rings here, what they're referring to are these, what everyone has called glands. Um, it's going to be these ports right here. So these are like high pressure uh, glands that they use for like deep sea uh, ROVs and things like that. Um, and we actually see that one popped off here. So is it possible that this was one of the failure points because there's one, two, three, four, and one of them came off. So is it possible that one of these glands is what failed because why else would it break off and why, why would only one of them break off? Once you have any failure, that implosion is going to be instant, but it's also going to be like a domino effect. So it's going to go to the next weakest link. So if this failed, then the carbon fiber at its weakest point is going to buckle. It's not necessarily that the carbon fiber failed. It could have been an, an, an it could have been a different location. So like this here, they were able to recover these uh, glands here. In this one, you can see they've got a few things coming out of this. One of them is the hydraulic line. And then these guys here are going to be for cables. Um, so like your electronics and all that, that's how these are passing through. This is this is the aft, uh, this is the aft um, ring here. So it's got four penetration plates or glands. And this right here, if you see this disc, this actually kind of resembles an anode so they probably this is probably one of the anodes for the frame which i wasn't sure about but now i i think that that's they did have an anode there for it so that's for the uh frame okay so the trim and ballast system on titan utilizes elements of the hp air system and the electric system used for dropping trim weight and, and adjusting the vent line of the soft variable ballast tank lead bricks are added to the landing gear skids as appropriate to achieve the desired in-water buoyancy before commencing a dive so under all this fairing material this is going to be forward of the tail cone there's this open uh there's this open bag here this open bottom lift bag and i'll show you an example of of one of those in a second and um and potentially what they should have used but they have this open bottom lift bag that fills with a, an hp air system well where's the tank the tank is going to be located the tank is going to be going to be located back here and i'll show you that here in just a second we'll go through uh, everything a little bit deeper um but this assists with the this assists with their buoyancy so if they need to add a little bit of air just to adjust their their trim but but this is also one of their last lines of defense in terms of getting back to the surface and staying on the surface. You know, they don't make it clear whether this bag would fill up and 
like break out of this fairing material. If they did, I wouldn't feel as bad about it. But to me, it seems like the bladder stays hidden and it's a because they keep calling it a ballast system. So I think that it stays hidden under this fairing material and it, and it can't expand. I'm not even sure if that's enough air to actually get them back to the surface. But let's take a look at an example of how this works. Okay, so there are two types of lift bags. There are, are open lift bags and there are enclosed lift bags. Ballast system is using, is essentially it's an open bottom lift bag. So the way that these work is that it's like an open balloon. It has an open bottom. This will be filled with water, right, when it's submerged. And then you can fill it with air. You can stick a hose in here and then fill this with air. Now, this had a hose pretty much plumbed inside of it the whole time, an open-ended hose. And they can fill this bladder up. Um, now, with this bladder, we have to imagine that it's going to stay hidden here inside of this fairing material so it wouldn't really be able to expand right like it would only be able to expand maybe a couple inches it wouldn't i don't think it's going to bust out of this fairing material now another cool thing with these lift bags is they have a string so you can pull the dump valve and let some of the air out but you can also grab the top of these and just pull the bag over and then the, the air will come back through the bottom it'll just drain right back out of the bottom. Now, one of the things you have to be careful of with these lift bags is, is the orientation. Now, these lift bags, you can't just attach them to anything and they'll stay if, we're, if you're doing a salvage project and, and you're lifting a boat and the boat starts to turn, these could potentially um, let air escape out of the bottom because these lift bags, remember they have an open bottom, you can grab the top of the lift bag if you wanted to yank it down and then the air would escape out of the bottom. Now this is old Jim Carter. He's uh, with Carter lift bags. They've been in the industry for decades. The other type of lift bag are going to be enclosed lift bags. So they're going to be like this. They're going to be like a pillow. Now you've probably seen these enclosed lift bags when they were trying to refloat the Lars James Cameron submersible that we went over. They they attach these lift bags when it gets back up to the surface. Well, so that so these lift bags here are fully enclosed. So it doesn't matter what orientation this thing rotates. You can sit there and spin it. it un, you can you can spin it underwater. It has multiple lifting points. You can hook it to end. You can rig to any of these lifting points. And it's going to hold the air no matter what. Now, with the open bottom lift bags, now remember we went over Boyle's Law and we know that at depth, if we fill these up and we send it to the surface, air is going to expand. Well, where's that air going to go? It's going to go out of the bottom of these lift bags. Now, that enclosed bag, where would all the air go? Would, it, would the lift bag just pop? No, there's a safety mechanism on these lift bags and these ones as well, but there's a dump valve at the top and it's an overpressure valve. So instead of, so instead of this pillow bag, if we filled it up halfway with air and then sent it up to the surface, the air would expand and then this bag would become completely full. And then what would happen? It wouldn't pop. It has this valve right here. It's an overpressurization valve. So when this valve, when this bag is completely full, it'll let air out of this valve automatically before it let, allows the bag to pop. Now, okay, so hold on to that thought for a second. Their weight and trim and ballast system, they just use standard, um, as Stockton Rush put it, they just use standard sewer pipe that you can get anywhere in the world. And these pipes go down these cages. It goes down on both sides. You can't really see it here on the rendering. Let me open this up for you guys. So you can't really see it here on the rendering too good, um, but these pipes would drop down this track on both sides. And then the hydraulic system would, and then there's a hydraulic system that has a gear on it down here and that would roll each pipe. So you can adjust, so you can adjust your trim by one pipe at a time. Now these pipes weigh 34 pounds in water each and they can add up to 408 pounds. That would be six pipes on the port side and six pipes on the starboard side. 
Now, in, a, in an emergency, this entire tray system, they can release out of here. And they would release that through this standard hand pump. And we saw one of those, one of these hydraulic lines um, that was that was twisted on one of those, uh, on one of the end rings there that I just showed you guys. So this is a typical hydraulic hand pump. This is a extremely simple system and the pressure inside of these lines is going to be enough to handle the crushing force of the of the 4000 meters that this thing is rated to now it says that it can jettison the entire tray so in an emergency situation if they need to get back to the surface immediately they can drop this entire tray and then there's a there's furthermore there's even a valve that they can turn inside and that would give them and that would allow them to use this pump to drop all of the legs if they needed to. Now, if they dropped the entire lower frame structure and the weights, I think that would raise the center of gravity up. And potentially, with the syntactic foam in the tail cone, that could potentially even raise the tail cone and drop the forward dome down so that the, so that the forward dome is facing downward. Now, and then if you're this emergency, and then if this air bladder system is one of your emergency systems, as we just went over, if it's not oriented properly, then it's not going to do anything for you in an, in an emergency situation. So if there was a slow leak, if there was some sort of flooding and this was taking on water and they had to drop all their extra weight and they, everything like that and water was incoming somewhere, well, potentially this wouldn't even get them back to the surface because they would need to have some sort of enclosed system, not an open system. And an enclosed system can be fine if they have valves that they can control internally. But this, I think, is a flaw. And also, just pay attention to the photo that they use in the manual that's just got frayed and chewed up hoses. Like, I don't even know why the heck they put this photo in here. It's just shocking to me. And just for anyone interested here, we have the schematics for the ballast, what they're calling the ballast tank. We know it's not a tank, but for the ballast. And then the uh, and they have uh, the HP cylinder. Let me show you where that is here. Okay, so here, so we're looking at the tail cone here. And this guy right here is the HP air tank. So the HP air tank, this is a 10,000 PSI tank. As you saw from our math calculations earlier, um, this vessel is rated to a depth of 5,800 PSI. So this is far more pressure than what is going to be required. Now, the caveat there is it's a 10,000 PSI tank. Whenever you use that tank, you're going to drain the pressure. However, it should be enough to for whatever that they're using it for. Um, now, now, a couple interesting things to note here. Stockton Rush said this is a BF Goodrich uh, air shock, like an air ride suspension, literally from a car. That's what he, that's what he said is on the Lars, um, and that's how the air is released. Somehow, I don't know why they chose that and why they chose a material that, again, is not suited for, for using it again using a material that's not only not suited for the marine environment but it's also not sub not but it's also not going to be subject to the to the harsh uv rays that you experience on the ocean you're getting the sun and you're getting all the reflection so i'll show you guys that here shortly these are the outside control valves for the air tank now this is going to be pre-dive. They're going to they're going to use this pre-post. They're going to use this pre and post dive. So for the for the vacuum, they're going to they're, so for the vacuum they want to suck the air out of the of the hole slightly just to make a seal, and then and then they'll put the and then once they confirm that they have a seal and then they'll flip the valve facing the other way so it's ready to dive now that diverts the air inside of the inside of the titan and then they can control it so that they can go to their 
so that they can use their ballast and whatnot. And then all this valve does is it either allows air to come in so they can fill the tank because they're not going to pull that tank. They're just going to leave it back there. So it allows it so that they can charge the tank and fill it up or they'll turn the handle over so that they have controls to, to all these. This looks like a new and improved sign that makes things a little bit easier. So easier to read. Um, this is their ballast system but i'm pretty sure what they're doing here is they're just trying to figure out their trim and their weight uh, i don't think they're doing any um anything major here i think that i think they just have these weights here so they can get everything dialed in now this is the valve i was mentioning to you just a little bit ago for the hydraulic system so they can turn the valve and use the emergency hand pump to drop the weights or they can use it to drop the entire landing gear. So they would be dropping the entire skids, the whole frame area here. So like I said, this hand pump is pretty straightforward. So you just pump by hand and with each pump, the piston comes out a little further. So imagine that piston being, um, being some sort of pin mechanism, which will allow these guys here to, to drop out if need be. So they can drop the weights and then they can hit the switch and they can drop the entire the lower frame, the landing skids and all that. Now we briefly touched on the O2 system earlier. There are four O2 tanks. There's uh, There are four O2 tanks below the deck. Those are gonna be emergency O2 tanks. And then they have one day use tank. And then we know about the um, the scrubber and the soda zorb. We went over that earlier. But one thing here is these lithium blankets. I didn't know what these were. It was my first time really digging into this. So the brand that they use are is Extendair, and they use these lithium hydroxide curtains. This is what provides them the additional 96 hours of oxygen. Um, in the case of, of an emergency and or if they have an issue with their o2 system say like the regulator fails or something like that they can hang these curtains and instead of using that rebreather system um, or that o2 scrubber system this essentially does the same thing in an emergency situation and so here we can see that um, they are used in submarines and it says here that they U.S. Navy has approved Micropores Extend Air Curtains for onboard their submarines. Um, and so they would look something like this. But they're stored in those ammo, ammo cans that we just looked at. And this is the uh, hydraulic schematic if anyone is interested. Um, the rest of the stuff, they're just going through their... The rest of the stuff is just mostly electronics and going through like their communication system navigation we've already went through all that i don't feel like i need to double back over everything uh one thing here though that i found kind of funny was that the, it says their lighting it, the source for external lighting on titan consists of four 9000 lumen led lights two on the port and two on the starboard for a total of 38,000 lumens. No, you have you don't have 38,000 lumens. You have four 9,000 lumen lights. So that I thought was pretty hilarious. They're just going over their sonar, propulsion. Now we've often seen this little guy right here. This orange, I think, is just a protective cover um, for the sphere. And you can see that it has uh, similarly has glands on it, um, just like just like the hole. Well, just like the rings I showed you earlier, just like the aft ring I showed you earlier. And then they've got some glands here for anywhere where there's a con or anywhere that there's a electrical connection uh, passing through into any of these boxes. Those all have those waterproof glands. And then all of these boxes here, and including this sphere, they're all filled with mineral oil so that they don't implode. So inside of that rubber uh, orange protective case, this is what they refer to as their control sphere. So it's got controls for thrusters. It's got their ethernet for their communications. Um, it's got power. So pretty much everything 
kind of at some point it comes through this sphere which is also filled with mineral oil and then also inside of the tail cone you guys have probably seen these big orange boxes these are batteries and to my knowledge there's two of them and then they just go over the lars launch and recovery systems i'm not going to bore you guys with all this if you want to look at all this i'll leave a link to this below but we kind of went through everything already and it's got surfacing procedures um, and then emergency procedures i'll be honest a lot of this stuff is just pretty boring and it's pretty vague there's nothing really that stands out here it's worth going over so this is a breaking news article from wired this was released on october 25th 2024 it says that a u.s attorney's office is investigating the company behind the doomed expedition to the wreck of the titanic the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York has contacted former Ocean Gate employees and expedition members as part as of an investigation probe. Wired has learned from multiple sources. Wired, Wired could not confirm the subject of the investigation and the U.S. Attorney's Office would not comment. However, several sources said that a forensic accountancy expert was one of the investigators and that the U.S. Postal Inspection Service was also involved. Although... OceanGate is based in Washington State. U.S. attorneys often investigate crimes across jurisdictions. The, the New York office has a strong history of complex financial investigations, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service also works on fraud and money laundering. OceanGate has attracted more than $28 million in investor funding, with much coming from family and friends, according to witnesses at last month's Coast Guard hearings. OceanGate actually comprises of multiple entities, including at least three for-profit U.S. companies, one Bahamanian corporation, and a non-profit foundation dedicated to oceanographic research and education. Untangling the flow of money and debt between these could be a complex affair. Documents obtained exclusively by Wired from an anonymous source give the most, com most complete public picture yet of OceanGate's corporate structure. The main company, OceanGate, built, tested, and maintained the Titan submersible as well as its predecessors, the Cyclops and Antipodes. OceanGate then sold the Titan to another company, Cyclops II LLC, which, could lease, which would lease the submersible back to OceanGate for five years at a time. The existence of Cyclops II LLC has not been previously reported and the company was not mentioned during the Coast Guard hearings. Business documents filed with the state of Alaska show that Cyclops 2 LLC was managed by OceanGate Incorporated and that two of the OceanGate Incorporated board members were investors in the company. Entities linked to Russia's family held about a quarter of its stock and the largest stockholder at more than 34% was Furman Mosley, the retired chairman of a Seattle-based paper mill company. None of the investors Wired can identify, nor the U.S. Postal Inspection Service responded to requests for comment. OceanGate declined to comment. Investors who would put at least $250,000 into Cyclops 2 LLC would receive quarterly payments back from the, lease of Titan, from the lease of Titan to OceanGate. For example, at the start of 2019, Titan was undergoing testing in the Bahamas and was still two years from its maiden voyage with paying passengers. Nevertheless, a document prepared for OceanGate board meeting reported Cyclops 2 LLC investors have already received 13% cash return from OceanGate contracting from OceanGate contracting the use of Titan. OceanGate stated that having investors own the submersibles provides unique cash flow and tax benefits. Such arrangements known as sale leasebacks are very common in commercial aviation where airlines sell planes to and then lease them back from investors or banks in order to free up capital. Airlines use planes like ATMs when they need cash, says Richard, an aviation consultant. Those deals typically include strict requirements for airlines to keep the planes in good condition and investors generally don't pay for annual maintenance or support of the vehicle, as Cyclops 2 LLC did for Titan. However, Aviation leasebacks were where the investing and leasing companies are managed by the same person, as happened with Rush in the Titan transaction, don't happen. According to the leaked documents, OceanGate Incorporated, having leased the Titan from Cyclops 2 LLC, would then lease the sub onto a third company, Argus Expeditions Limited, 
later known as Ocean Gate Expeditions. It was this wholly owned subsidiary incorporated in the Bahamas that received funds from passengers for the Titanic and other tours. The Ocean Gate Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit, was also closely linked to the commercial businesses, although filings with the U.S. Internal Revenue Service do not indicate the source of most of its $1.5 million in contributions, they show hundreds of thousands of dollars flowing back to OceanGate Incorporated to pay for educational and research expeditions. These types of convoluted structures have been used by OceanGate for years. An earlier purchase leaseback company called Cyclops One LLC that dealt with the Titan's predecessor, Submersible, had some backers returned for nearly 90% on their initial investment. By the summer of 2019, Argus Expeditions was sitting on around $500,000 in cash, while OceanGate had itself $1.2 million in the bank. The apparent success of the leaseback arrangement might explain how Rush was able to attract what was OceanGate's largest ever investment in 2020 at a time when the company was working on the expensive task of replacing the Titan's first hole that it cracked during testing. The $18 million in equity funding allowed OceanGate to rebuild the Titan and move forward with its first Titanic expedition in 2021. Around this time, documents indicate that OceanGate may have had more control in the taking over ownership of Cyclops 2 LLC. But by 2023, OceanGate seemed to be on a much shakier financial footing. Several witnesses at the Coast Guard hearings testified to what they perceived to be OceanGate's financial difficulties in the run-up to the Titanic expedition, including Rush foregoing his salary and occasionally loaning the company money from his personal funds. And the article goes on to discuss uh, the lawsuit from PH Nargolay's estate. Uh, they're suing OceanGate. So I hope you guys enjoyed part five of this series and learned something. Like I said, there's 27 documents that they released. Uh, one of the documents was a duplicate, and then uh, some of these documents are just marketing brochures. Um, in the next video, I would like to go over the Evologix data. So this is the actual transcripts of the text messages that were sent back and forth between the Titan and the Polar Prince the day of the tragedy. Um, and there's also some emails that's sent in there um, going back to going back to the manufacturer and asking them for assistance. So there's important data we want to go through there. There are also some emails uh, regarding the deep ocean test facility when they did some testing on the hull and uh, some, some corresponding emails there. And then just some interesting photos. Thank you guys so much for all your support. Um, it truly does mean a lot and thanks for being patient. Make sure to like and subscribe. And if you guys have any comments or questions, um, would like to give any feedback or criticism, feel free to leave that down below in the comment section. I welcome all criticism and comments and feedback and all that. So it's going to take me a while, but I am working on a Patreon right now where I'm going to be releasing more behind the scenes posts. So stuff from like my daily life, more of like work and personal stuff, uh, personal updates and photos, short video clips, things like that, actual dive footage and dives in some of those um, sort of like adventures uh, throughout my career. Cause there's been lots of dives and, and, and these days I'm not diving deep or doing anything crazy anymore, but still some of the dives I think you guys would find interesting. So if you guys are interested in that, that will be there. And then also if there's anyone interested in like mentorship um, or anyone looking to get into the diving industry, um, I, that may be possibly a tier as well. So this way you could just kind of pick up on little tricks of the trade and things that I do um, and give you help maybe spark some ideas. It'll also give uh, you guys access to me so that you can reach out to me with other questions. You can uh, provide video suggestions. If you're in the diving industry, you can talk with me directly. If you're a young diver looking to get into the industry, you can talk with me personally. Um, I have no problem being like um, being somewhat of, of a mentor. I mean, like I said, I've been in the industry for over a decade. Uh, I have thousands of dives. I have lots of um, experience. I do have lots of experience to share with you guys. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. Uh, but I'm working on that right now. Thank you guys for all your support. I'll see you next week. Dive safe.